Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome those of you joining us just now from Knox Hall in our modern worship service, as well as those of you watching online or listening by radio. And I want to thank all of you for your continued prayers for my healing after my surgery. Uh, so many of you last week told me how good I look, and you were so generous with your compliments. And I've discovered the secret to looking so good is to have people expect you to look so bad. <laughs> the contrast is the key. And a lot of you commented on my weight loss. Uh, that, that is one of the benefits of hospital time. And with, uh, with abdominal surgery, because of the prep involved before the surgery and the dietary restrictions afterwards, uh, I, I really went for two weeks without eating. And uh, my previous record had been two hours. Uh, <laughs> So I am doing very well. Doctors have cleared me for participation in a trip to Israel, which departs later this week. Uh, we planned this trip to the land of the Bible. I'm the group leader. We have 37 people going. We planned this trip more than a year ago, way before my cancer diagnosis. And of course, my participation has been in jeopardy with, uh, with my recent surgery. But doctors have, have cleared me. Uh, to participate, so I will not be here next Sunday, uh, but I'll be back the next week filled with fresh inspiration from the Holy Land. Uh, when, I was in, when I was in the hospital, I told my, my nurse that right after this surgery, I'm going to the Promised Land. <laughs> she said, wow, you don't have much hope for this surgery, do you? And, no, not, not the promised land. I'm going to the land of the Bible, and there's no place on planet Earth quite like that place. Our topic this morning is prayer, and this is a theme we've been coming back to again and again this year. We started the fall season with a series called Dangerous Prayers, and we talked about praying persistently. Over the course of Lent, we used a curriculum called the Circle Maker, and we learned to pray more specifically and more boldly. We've been trying to learn about prayer from the master prayer himself, Jesus, and this is all a really good thing. Prayer may remain a mystery, but sooner or later, everybody turns to prayer. Everybody prays. When you hit those ragged edges of life, like when your business goes bust, or your marriage hits the rocks, or a teenager runs away from home, or the diagnosis is terminal. When we hit those ragged edges of life, what do we do? We pray. It's a basic human instinct to pray, and it begs the million-dollar question that I want to address this morning, does prayer actually work? Or to put it more personally and in line with our series, why isn't God answering my prayers? And as I thought about that, uh, I think really all of us gathered here today fall into one of three categories in our attitude towards prayer. And this morning, I just want to walk through these three categories together. And the first group of people that are here this morning uh, are, are doubters when it comes to prayer. That's the first category. We have doubts about prayer because we have doubts about God. We doubt that God really cares about us. And if God does care about us, does he have the power to do something about it? We may even doubt that God actually exists. And let me say this morning, if you're here today and you're a doubter, you are in good company. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, doubters are people who search for answers, who seek the truth. And as we said last Sunday, God honors truth-seeking. So if you're here today and you're among the doubters, uh, welcome to you. You're in very good company. But it's my job this morning to tell you what the Bible says about prayer, and the weight of biblical evidence on this, the weight of biblical teaching, says that in order for prayer to work, there must be some level of faith that is present in God and in God's ability to respond. That's what the writer of Hebrews says when he writes in Hebrews 11:6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And I know right away some of you are thinking, well, then I'm out because I don't believe fully, because I do have doubts. 
and the disciples of Jesus felt the very same thing. And one day Jesus was teaching about prayer and the disciples brought this concern to them that they don't fully believe. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a what? Mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Do you have any mountains in your life this morning? Anybody facing a big obstacle or challenge? Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain to move in prayer. You, you know how small a mustard seed is? You can fit several thousand of them in the palm of your hand. And what Jesus is teaching here is that you don't actually need a lot of faith. You need some faith, but you don't need a lot of faith to see prayer work in your life. What he's teaching is that it's not the amount of faith that matters, it's the object of faith that matters. What matters is not how much faith you have, but what you place your faith in. I've used the illustration before of a, of a frozen pond, and there's a 200-pound man standing next to that pond. He used to weigh more, but he's recently been through surgery, and he's dropped some weight. <laughs> And on this particular day, the pond is just, the, the, the ice on top of the pond is just paper thin, uh, very fragile. But this 200 pound man standing next to the pond, he has full confidence, full faith that the ice will hold him up. He really believes. And as an act of faith, he jumps onto that frozen pond. And what do you think happened? He went right through. Now another day, same pond, same man, but on this day, the pond is completely frozen all the way to the bottom. It is thick. Uh, you could drive a Mack truck on this ice and it would not break. But in this day, the 200 pound man, his, his, his faith is wavering. He's not sure, he just knows that ice cannot hold him. He knows he's gonna plunge right through it to his icy death, but he musters together enough faith and he jumps onto that pond and what happens? He stands solid on the ice, maybe falls on his bottom. He had no faith at all. What, what matters is not the amount of faith that the man has. What matters is that the ice is solid. What matters is what he places his faith in. So what matters is not whether you have a little bit of faith or a lot of faith. Whether you have a little faith or a lot of faith, you still can see prayer work. Because faith and doubt are not mutually exclusive. They are different sides of the same coin. One day Jesus met a man, you heard the story read earlier uh, this morning, and the man says, Jesus, if you are able, will you heal my son? And you heard Jesus said, if I am able, all things are possible for the one who believes. And then the father replied in what I call the doubter's prayer. And it's a prayer that some of us may need to pray today in Mark 9, 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, and then read the rest with me, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I, I do believe, and I don't believe at the same time. Help me, God. I, I, I have doubts. And Jesus is teaching that even if you believe and don't believe, if you have those doubts, all you need is enough faith to come to God to ask. That's how much faith is required. But does God really care about my needs? Does God really, uh, is he really interested in what's going on in my life? Is he willing to respond to my prayers? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples and us a prayer, a simple prayer, that we now today know as the Lord's Prayer. And in this prayer, Jesus revolutionized the way people think about God and about praying. Jesus said, when you pray, when you start your prayer, you can address God this way, our Father in heaven. Those words are familiar to us, but in that day they were revolutionary, and he, Jesus blew away all the misconceptions that people had about God. In that simple phrase, our Father in heaven, Jesus is teaching that God is not some demanding tyrant barking orders over the edge of heaven. In that simple phrase, our Father in heaven, Jesus taught that God is not some detached, impersonal force who is unengaged and uncaring. God is our Father. It's personal. 
He's our heavenly father who cares about his children. And then he went on to reinforce this concept when he taught in Matthew chapter 7. Which of you, Jesus said, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Implied answer, nobody would do that. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. Who would do that? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God loves to give good gifts to his children. The Apostle Paul builds on this in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? The Bible teaches that God did move heaven and earth to care for us. And that's why the Apostle Paul would write later in his letter in 1 Peter chapter 5, would you read this one aloud with me? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God is a caring, loving father. Now, there are going to be times in your life where you're going to doubt God, and you will pray anyway. Everybody prays. Uh, What percentage of parents of high school students at Santa Fe High School in Texas, what percentage of those parents do you think prayed this last Friday? All of them? I think there are parents in Texas who might say, I don't think of myself as a religious person. I'm not even sure I believe that God exists, but I prayed. It's like nobody's business on Friday. And maybe you are there this morning, and you might say, I'm not sure what I believe in God. I'm not a religious person. But I have no alternative but to pray. I, I don't know where else to turn but to pray. And if that's you, you can pray the doubter's prayer. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And if you pray that prayer, you might discover that God does care and that he is present and he will respond. But there are others here this morning who fall in a different category. Uh, There are those of us who tried prayer and it didn't seem to work. We, We asked God for something and we didn't get it and we're disappointed. Uh, Lily Tomlin uh, once said, I always prayed that I would be somebody. I should have been more specific, she said. (laughs) She sounds kind of disappointed, doesn't she? We've all asked for things in prayer that we did not get. I've asked for things in prayer that God did not respond to. And frankly, if God had given me everything I've ever asked for, it would have ruined me. In hindsight, a lot of us can say, I'm glad that God didn't give me what I asked for because that would not have been good for me. Billy Graham's wife, Ruth, uh, one one time said, uh, God has not always answered my prayers. If God had always answered my prayers, I would have married the wrong man several times, she said. There are times where I've prayed for things and God did not respond in the ways that I've asked. And the Bible says that God doesn't want to give me things that will be detrimental to me. James, the brother of Jesus, explains it this way in James chapter 4. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with what? Wrong motives. That you may spend uh, what you get on your pleasures. When you and I pray for bad or foolish things, we should not expect God to answer those prayers. God loves us too much to indulge our every whim. But what about those times when we pray for good things, with good motives, for right reasons, in a God-honoring way, and God still doesn't answer that prayer? When we pray for a marriage to be saved and it ends in divorce. When we pray for a mate that never comes into our life. When we pray for a child but we can't get pregnant. When we pray for a healing that doesn't take place. Why doesn't God answer those prayers? And the best answer that I can give you this morning is that I don't know. I don't know why God seems to answer some prayers and not others. We can easily find ourselves when that happens in the valley of disappointment. And it's a very lonely place. And it's a place maybe some of you are today 
where you're wondering if God has abandoned you, if he's listening, if he can hear you, if he's even there. Now, personally, I can tell you that my own confidence in prayer right now in my life is at an all-time high. You probably know that nine months ago, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. What you probably don't know, because I never told many people, is that I had a rare form of colon cancer, uh, signet ring cell. Only 1% of colon cancer patients have signet ring cell. It's very aggressive with a very poor prognosis. Now, doctors have a good idea about how this particular type of cancer spreads in the abdomen. There are patterns to where it goes, and doctors were pretty sure that it had spread throughout my abdomen, and so we planned an aggressive surgery based on these patterns. And as I've told you, the surgeon opened me up wide and took samples and took some things out preventatively, but the doctor did not find what he expected to see. There was no cancer there. The doctors were surprised. Right? I love it when doctors are surprised. No cancer. How do you explain that? Could it be that hundreds of people have been praying for the cancer to be gone? Could it be the petitions for healing that were made on my behalf? I don't know what else to say. I, I believe that God healed me. But let's be honest. Here's the dilemma, isn't it? There's a man in our church, a godly man I respect a great deal, who is diagnosed with cancer. Hundreds of us prayed fervently for his healing, and he died. I can't explain that. I don't know why one person gets healed and another person does not. I can tell you that this man, this friend of mine, he and I felt the same way. We had the same confidence that we would be okay no matter what happened, whether God healed us in this lifetime or whether God healed us unto glory. Just before Easter, one of our elders told me that he had invited a friend to come to Easter services, and this friend had walked away from the church years ago, and then the elder told me the reason why his friend had walked away from church, because this guy uh, was good friends with a pastor who got cancer and died. And the man just chucked all of his faith. As I thought about that, I really started feeling some pressure to get healed. <laughs> you know, I hate to be responsible for anybody leaving the church. I, I've got people praying for me. I don't want to disappoint anybody. So let me correct uh, what could drift as I celebrate full healing let me correct what could drift to be some bad theology those of you that have been praying for my healing thank you very much but let's say that instead of the report that I was cancer free the report that was given instead said that they had found cancer riddled throughout my body and that I had only a few months to live those of you that were praying how would you interpret that does that make God any less God? Does it make God less good? For generations, people of faith have gathered in all situations and circumstances and proclaimed that God is good and that God knows what he's doing even when we don't understand. Still, when our prayers are not answered in the ways that we're hoping or asking, it can transport us to the valley of disappointment, and this valley is a deep one. And I want you to know this morning, if you find yourself in the valley of disappointment, that Jesus knows what you're going through because he has spent time there too. The valley of disappointment that Jesus knew, it was called the Garden of Gethsemane. And he went there to pray, and you know the story that he prayed so in intently that, that, that he sweat drops of blood. Why was he praying so intently? Well, he knew what he was going to face. He knew that on that very night he would be betrayed. He knew that he would be arrested, beaten, and tortured. He knew that he would be crucified on a cross and would suffer a slow, excruciating, painful death. And in his humanity, he wanted to avoid that. And so we read in Matthew 26, 39, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup 
be taken from me. My father, there's that title again, Abba, Daddy, God, all things are possible for you. God, you can do all things, and if there's any way possible that I can avoid going through this, that I can avoid this experience to, to bring your wonderful plan of redemption to the human race, to bring salvation, if there is another way, take this cup from me. I, I don't want to go through this. And the Father did not give Jesus what he asked for. Now Jesus went on to pray one more line. I'm so glad that he did. Matthew 26, 39b, let's read the second part of Jesus' prayer together. Yet not as I will, but as you will. This is the prayer of the disappointed. When you don't get what you ask for, you pray, God, this is what I want, this is my will, but God, I assume there is an, another will, there is an, another greater plan that I don't fully understand, so not my will, but your will. I'm so glad that Jesus prayed this prayer. When you find yourself in the valley of disappointment, I want you to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray the prayer of the disappointed. Not my will, but your greater will, which I don't fully understand. And when you pray that prayer, there will come a time, it might be in this life, might be in the life to come, that your disappointment will be changed into contentment, into joy, into celebration. That day will come, but until then, not my will, but your will. There's at least one other reason that prayer doesn't work for many of us, and it's because we just don't do it. Right? We believe in God, we believe that God uh, is willing and caring and that God answers prayers and that God is our Heavenly Father, we just don't actually pray. We get too busy, we get too tired, we get too worried, we get too distracted. Many of us are distracted prayers. We just don't do it very much and so we don't get the opportunity to see God work through prayer. Now, there are a lot of ways, a lot, a lot of helps to, to, to help us become more consistent prayers. Uh, you, you can establish a regular meeting time with God each day. Some of you have done that. You can pray while you exercise or jog. Some of you do that. You can journal and write out your thoughts. Some of you do that. But I want you to know that what's really helped me blossom in my prayer journey is to realize that prayer is not just a discipline. It is an adventure with the living God. That prayer is my lifeline to the best friend that I will ever know. That prayer is getting online with God anytime, anywhere, any place, under any circumstances, that he's always listening, waiting, and available. And that's why the Apostle Paul could write in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually, continually, that prayer is an ongoing conversation with God that I can have in my car, in my grocery store, on the airplane, that he's always available, he's always listening, that he is my heavenly father who is eager to gauge in relationship with me. I can be driving down the freeway and someone cuts me off and I can say, God bless you, my friend. <laughs> and I can feel my blood pressure going down and my patience going up. When you get a hold of the fact that prayer is an ongoing relationship, an ongoing dialogue with the creator of the universe, moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, with the almighty God, the most powerful person in the world, who also happens to be your best friend and cares for you more than anybody else on the planet because he is your heavenly father. When you get a hold of that, it will transform the way that you pray. It will transform you from being a doubting, disappointed, distracted prayer to being a dangerous prayer. I want to give us just a moment to practice what we've talked about. So before we leave this place and go back to the busyness of our lives, I'd like to invite you to a moment of silent prayer. If you'd please kind of bow your heads both here and in Knox Hall. And just take a few moments right now to talk to God. You can talk with God about anything that's on your mind. You can bring a need to him that you have or maybe the need of a friend. You can tell God that you're angry or disappointed. 
or maybe you just want to thank God for something. But let's be quiet for just a moment and talk to the God who loves us so much. Father in heaven, thank you for listening. Thank you for always being available. Thank you for making prayer possible. Our relationship with you is very important to us. Thank you for being our caring, loving, heavenly Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.